And now, please welcome IFC Global Director of Health and Education, Fareed Fezwa, United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs Assistant Secretary General, Naveed Hanif, President of Roche Diagnostics Asia Pacific, Lance Little, and the World Health Organization's Africa Regional Director, Dr. Matsudiso Moedi. This discussion, a roadmap to resilient and universal health, is moderated by FP's Executive Vice President, Alison Carlson. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And I am honored to have this esteemed panel with us tonight and also to build on the conversations that we all just heard. Um, thank you for being with us tonight. And again, this was mentioned at the beginning, but we would love this to be interactive. And so if you do have questions, please submit them. There's a tremendous amount of knowledge and expertise in this room, and we want to make sure that it is all harnessed. So I'd like to start off by building on the conversation that we just heard and also nesting us in where we presently are amid the UN General Assembly and the SDG global stock take and the high level meetings on UHC, pandemic preparedness and TB. And so Assistant Secretary General, I'd like to turn to you first. You know, working with UNDESA, you are focused very intently and squarely on the SDGs. So in the work that you're doing and across the agency at the UN, how does diagnostics fit into that? And how does that fit into the SDGs and achieving those goals? Thank you so much. First, you just mentioned the stock take. And the picture on SDGs is very sobering. The reports we have released, we have just accomplished 15% of the targets. 30% uh, 30, 30 are in reverse and 30% are stalled. So, but the strength of the sustainable development goals, which we always present as one of the major accomplishments of the UN is, goals are deeply interlinked. They are goals which deal with all aspects of life. So if I talk about achieving health, Outcomes, it's not about absence of illness. Health means in, in total well-being of human beings. And that you cannot accomplish unless you address SDG 2, food and nutrition. And it also has to have water and sanitation, SDG 6. So they are all very deeply linked. And I also have to mention patterns of industrialization in a society will also impact health outcomes, means of transportation, human settlements. So all of these goals have direct, indirect impacts on health outcomes. Then socioeconomic factors, where you live, discrimination, marginalization, segregation, all of these factors will also come into play. So if you look at the totality of the sustainable development goals, health should not be taken in isolation. At the same time, we need solid health systems. And I think nothing drove that home more forcefully than COVID. Countries who had better health systems, they did better than many others who were struggling. And health systems, one fundamental strength is diagnostics. If you want countries to lower their health costs and also improve the well-being of their citizens, Diagnostics are critical. You can prevent diseases. You can have early detection. You can avoid outcomes which leave, leave, lead to major expenditures. So for that purpose, diagnostics are key for achieving the health outcomes agreed in the Sustainable Development Goals. But health systems which have strong diagnostics should remain affordable. And that's where I will end my first point, that what we are learning and from a large number of countries, they are keen to have these facilities, these technologies, but they are not cost effective. They're not easily deployable. They're not accessible. So that's the challenge which we are facing in diagnostics. Thank you for that. I think that really helps 
frame the conversation. And I'd like to dive into and pick up on something that you just said about the lessons learned, certainly from COVID-19. There were a lot of examples in the last conversation that really resonated. And there's so much that can still be learned, not only that you know was common across countries and regions, but also what was very regionally and locally specific. And so Dr. Mowedi, I'd like to turn to you. And when you reflect on COVID-19 and also some other you know, pandemics and emergencies that have that you know you've grappled with across the African content, what are some of the poignant lessons learned that can be brought to bear as we think of you know the role of diagnostics and the importance of early investment? Thank you very much. Thanks for having invited me to join this very important um, conversation. I actually think that um, what we learned from COVID-19 really dramatically was the importance of diagnostics enabling you to know what's coming, enabling you to know what was there that you needed to deal with. And that's something that we've seen with other disease outbreaks as well. I have to say, some of the most poignant moments that I recall as the regional director of WHO was being on the phone with ministers of health of some of the small countries when the lockdowns had happened internationally, when, like, when um, diagnostic um, facilities, diagnostic supplies were not available, and really trying to map with the minister, you'll get this component from that city, Western cities. And then you might find you need the machine. The machine will come from somewhere else. And now we're going to try and find a place that will actually fly this to your country. It was, I've had about three conversations like this where we were doing mapping of different components of what would be a testing package and then looking for the transportation for it. So that's one that, that really highlighted the importance of diagnostics and I think that's something that we're going to take into the future, obviously. But I think as well, a hopeful, uh, though reflecting some inefficiencies and fragmentation um, aspect of this was the fact that we were able to ramp up genomic sequencing in African countries, starting with two or three centers that have that capacity to almost all of the countries, really, in, in a year or so. Partly because some of the components that are needed had been there in different disease programs, some were in HIV, some were in uh, polio, some were in influenza, and we had to, and that took quite a lot of work. So that fragmentation meant we had to work with our staff, our laboratory staff in WHO, and with, with colleagues in the Africa CDC, and organize partnerships between sometimes lives that are next door to each other in a, in a country that never had worked together. So I think that taught us a lesson, not only about investing in diagnostics as part of the package that's going to carry us to universal health coverage, but how to organize this more efficiently so that we recognize what we have from its fundamental role and we're able to put them all together and, and scale, scale this up in ways that have made, I hope, partnerships and friendships from different disease-related diagnostic systems as part of a health system of a country that supports early diagnosis and that very much also is going to support preparation for and response to disease outbreaks. Thank you for that. And you know, it's fascinating to think about the mapping that was done and in that situation of crisis, you know, the vulnerabilities that become very clear and resolute very quickly mm -hmm. and how that kind of systematic mapping then can inform greater preparedness going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and I appreciate your mention of the opportunity and the mobilization and the rapid mobilization. I think there's a lot to be learned from that too. You know, Lance, I'd like to turn to you and in your experience over the last few years in COVID-19 across the Asia Pacific, you know, what are some of the, the lessons learned and upon reflection, you know, poignant moments for you and how can, you know, in instances that are very different and the environment is different, the culture is different um, and everything is needs to be contextually relevant. How can you address an emergency situation, the needs of, you know, of local populations at scale? Yeah, thanks, Alison. Great question. And 
Dr. Moiti, I was often on the other end of those phone calls trying okay. to find the instruments and the reagents to, to serve the, um, the COVID challenge. I think, but this was a really important learning um, for not only the healthcare systems, but all the players within the healthcare systems, including the role that industry plays as well here. And what I say that is when, when we addressed the COVID challenge, Within a matter of 30 plus days, we had a COVID assay that was built, but we went to our high volume systems. We knew that if we're going to screen the world, we need high volume systems. And I think this is a really important element that comes through when you start taking diagnostics a layer deeper. There are many tools that, that can be used in the diagnostics environment, and in some cases, in some populations, where access is very difficult, there's a place for point of care. Um, but equally, that has to be balanced with the horsepower that's needed to drive large screening programs, and whether we're talking about COVID or whether we're, we're talking about TB or hepatitis or whatever it might be. And we had a great example on the panel earlier about the success of the hepatitis program in, in Egypt, where I believe they used a combination of multiple technologies, and that was one of our learnings. So we, we learned to deal with high volume first, and then we brought through the point of care test. But I think the other thing that became evident during COVID was the disparity of healthcare systems. And we've talked about um, diagnostics, and, and, I, and I love um, the term. I, I, I used foundation. I like bedrock better. That was used in the earlier panel. It, it, I love that. But the reality is, diagnostics today is the bedrock of, of healthcare. Without knowing what to do, a clinician can't make a decision. Now, the truth of the matter is, everybody on that side of the room doesn't get access. 47% of the world today does not get access to basic diagnostics. And we're not talking about genome sequencing, we're talking about a glucose and a creatinine. Basic stuff. So there's a huge amount of work to be done here. And, and I think framing diagnostics is, is, is critical because the word itself, diagnose, diagnose a disease. And when I was working in labs 30 years ago, that's where diagnostics was. But it's evolved over time now, and it's moved upstream and if you think about the role of diagnostics and the return on investment to diagnose a disease correctly, that'll save lives. Use of diagnostics well and properly to predict disease, that'll save lives and money. And that's critical. And I think that was touched on again with the gentleman from Egypt in the earlier panel. So the role of diagnostics is the bedrock of healthcare. We learned some lessons in COVID, but let's not anchor all of diagnostics just around COVID. Let's take the lessons and apply it right across disease areas and right across countries. When we're talking about lives and the return on investment, um, that naturally brings me to you, Fareed. When you're thinking about your portfolio of investments at the IFC, and how you can strategically channel those investment to effectively address these issues of access and inequity that are pervasive, particularly across low and middle income countries. How are you thinking about that? And how can you ensure that those resources, which are of course constrained, are deployed in the most effective way possible? So thanks. Uh, you know, first of all, I, I'd like maybe to take a step back on before I get to the investment and return on investment. Um, you know, the the diagnostic and and the range of diagnostic is quite large. You know, we're talking of pathology and lab diagnostic, but you can go all the way to the spectrum of of diagnostic imaging, which then takes us to NCDs. So, and and the investment across that spectrum is, is very different. But before I go there, I would like to reaffirm, and I think you know, my co-panelists have done that, the role of diagnostic within any referral system, within a, a healthcare system. And I think you know, it's difficult to think in terms of poor diagnostic and efficient health system or strong health system. For me, that's the, the basics. And you know, we were looking at some of the data that actually Dr. Martin 
come from WHO. When we look at today, and we're post-COVID and post everything we've gone through, still only 30% of the health facilities in Africa have access to reagents and equipment to perform basic diagnostic, basic diagnostic. And if you go down with the same study, you know, the worst availability is at primary care. So what should be your first level of the bedrock of your health system is the most poorly you know, uh, granted access to diagnostic, which I think is, makes us think in terms of you know, going from response to a pandemic to how do we build resilience and sustainability. So I come now to the investment. So IFC as the, the private sector arm of the World Bank, you know, has spent about $9 billion uh, since 1999 in, yeah, I think something went wrong. Uh, since 1999 in investment in healthcare access and quality. So it's $9 billion. But, and through the private sector, and, and I'm just mentioning the private sector because this is what IFC within the World Bank Group uh, provides. But the portfolio of the World Bank Group is $34 billion. So a big chunk of that has gone into working on strengthening the health system. And I think COVID showed us that within the value chain, the health value chain, we encountered huge bottlenecks in supply of equipment, of vaccine, of drugs, and diagnostic was a big one. So now how do we move from response, which was what it was, but it was emergency response, to building more sustainability into that. So what we've elected to do over the last two years, two, three years, is really to invest into local capabilities of, I think, production of these diagnostics and vaccines and pharmaceuticals. So we're very focused in investing into that, either through the private sector that has the capability to ramp up these production, because I think if you want to be able to supply these reagents, these equipment, they need to be close to where they're utilized and consumed. And it's not with, we saw that the global supply chain, when there is a surge in the needs and, and capacity, just fail on you. So I think we're focusing on, on that. Um, there is definitely, particularly on the, on the large spectrum of diagnostic, it's difficult in some cases to see how you're going to get potentially a return on investment. So we typically work through debt and we can lend to the private sector. And we've done that with uh, healthcare providers and health services providers in Africa, for instance, but also in Asia, working with uh, um, lab networks that across the countries can bring the cost of uh, availability first and cost of uh, diagnostic at the right level uh, to, to ensure access. Um, but beyond that, we're also working in um, helping you know, SMEs, particularly health providers, getting access to equipment in diagnostic through, you know, we've, uh, on Africa, coming back to Africa, we've uh, set up a $300 million Africa medical equipment financing facility that is specifically designed to allow access to some of these equipments, including diagnostic to these uh, SME healthcare providers. You know, it's been underscored the importance of primary care and that infrastructure and capacity building at the local level, as well as partnerships. And I'd like to turn both to Dr. Moethi and Lance, and then I'll come back to you, Assistant Secretary General. In your experience, what are some examples of partnerships at the local level that are working and having an impact? I think there's a lot that can be learned from those kinds of models. And certainly they can't necessarily be replicated, but potentially adapted to understand what is working to actually address those needs on the ground. Um, I, I mean, I think 
At, at the local level, if you look within um, systems in some countries, I think you, you can find that, uh, for example, in, in the area of um, neglected tropical diseases, you can find that you get different partners that work together, that work with the local health system, that work with the community health workers, that work with the primary system, and that work with communities as well, in order to bring in the capacities that are needed, but to mobilize the time, the capacity of those people to work with the local health system as well. I think those, those types of partnerships can really be helpful. And if we integrate into that better capacity for uh, diagnosing, for predicting, I agree very much that we need to look beyond what's happening now, but to look to be able to anticipate what's going to, harm based, what's going to come based on the data that we've got, then you can unleash the partnerships for interventions to prevent as well as to make sure that people have access to treatment and be further up the system. So I think there are some, but clearly there is need for much more investment at the local level. Because I think the traditional way of investing in diagnostics is to start in big hospitals, which are some of the most inefficient institutions. We have, we have data showing that if you invest there, then who reaches there and what sort of um, use is made of, of, of these such facilities. So I agree very strongly that really getting to the district level, to the primary care level, will be the best way to achieve results with the investments that are made. Thank you for that. And Lance, how are you seeing the private sector really partner on the ground? It's an interesting question. Um, you know, from my lens, I always consider every time we set up a laboratory and, aim, and enable their testing, it, it's a public-private partnership, actually. Um, and, and the important piece here is, is our role in that partnership, which goes beyond just dropping a machine in and delivering some reagents. So we'll, we, we'll invest a lot in training the staff working with the pathologist for interpreting results. Um, it goes a long way beyond just the instrument, for example. And I think this is an important element for um, any, any healthcare system, depending on where they are on the development curve, needs to choose partners that are there and are going to be part of the village of delivering healthcare. You're not just playing on the sidelines, right? We're, we're in it, everybody needs to be in it together, and you play a role. In our case, we have an expertise in diagnostic biomarkers, so it's our role to deliver that knowledge and help the, the local healthcare system learn from that and make the be do the best outcomes for the patient. No, I think that's a great point. I've visited many hospitals and at different levels of the system. I don't remember, I can't remember how many times I've been told, we bought this equipment and then there's no plan for how to maintain it. We bought it from wherever yeah. and I don't know, something wrong, small goes wrong with it and it's sitting there unused and there's no uh, structure for continuing to, 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 to make sure that it's working. I mean, those graveyards of maintenance in the, at the back of hospitals that one has visited all over the region really tell the importance of that story, I think it's an absolutely important point. We talk about diagnostics in a little bit of a flippant way. It's great that we're talking about it, but let's not be flippant about it. A high volume molecular testing instrument for virology like was used during COVID is 25,000 parts in that instrument. So dropping one of those yeah. in to Give any country, yeah, it has to have the support and the networks, and that's the role that we would play. Absolutely, and let's not only be not flippant about it, but also find ways that this message about ROI that was discussed here, but also on the previous panel, really resonates because it seems like that message isn't getting across and the need for greater investment upstream and the cascading benefits from that, and also the cost of an action and what could happen if those investments aren't made and we aren't prepared for the next pandemic or the next disease to come. So I'm gonna end with you, Assistant Secretary General, and then unfortunately we've run out of time. But again, in light of the high level meetings, how can we make that message about the ROI and the need for primary care resonate in this moment so that diagnostics are higher priority on the agenda? The need resonates, no question about it. But let me frame it to, uh, I really admire the way field operations have come into focus and the partnerships are critical because we are having three summers on health. 
you know, this week, one is on pandemic, pandemic preparedness, prevention, response, and HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis. Two issues kept on resurfacing in all negotiations. One, there are 3.3 billion people living in countries who spend more on debt servicing than on health or education. Fiscal space is not there. Public sector wants to invest, just cannot invest. Second, which was an agreement reached 23 years ago, intellectual property rights. And I'm for intellectual property rights, but you have to strike a balance between human rights and IPRs. When children are dying, people are desperate to get diagnostic um, kits. You have to think about human beings, not IPRs. And there was an agreement in Doha 23 years ago. We will suspend IPR if there's a public health emergency. But we didn't do it, and we were hit by COVID. So these two issues have been repeatedly mentioned in all health summits, that if you do not look at the global picture, be it diagnostics, health systems, investing in primary care, these cannot work. So we need to also look at the bottlenecks that we are confronted with, both on the industry side, and I'm, I know they spend billions of dollars in R&D. They need return. Public sector has to move in. They did it for HIV AIDS. Public sector came in. So we need to look at those macro solutions also if we want countries to take health seriously. Absolutely, and thank you for that. And one last note on mobilizing finance. I know you wanted to make two more points quickly, and yeah. I know we're, we're just out of time. No, it's just thank one you. point, because I think if there is a space that where PPP, public-private partnership, on financing can make a difference is this is primary care, it's diagnostic because, and, and Dr. Moti just hit the nail on the head, it's not just about supplying equipment or reagents. It's about making that supply and availability you know, sustainable over time. So being able to structure financing and when the government fiscus are tensed, this is probably the only way you would finance the availability at primary care or the other level of care. And, and we're working very closely with some of the countries to set up PPP, long-term PPPs, where both the public sector and the private sector has obligation. But once you give the visibility to a private sector to invest into equipping facilities at primary care and secondary care, and to provide service and maintenance, training, capacity building, not over six months, over 10 years, over 15 years. And that's funded through a mechanism that DFIs like the World Bank Group can help the government fiscus fund, then you're really delivering, and that's the, the real return on investment, is the availability of those services to the patients. Absolutely, and the sustainability of it. So thank you for that, and thanks to all of you for your work and for joining us this evening. We really appreciate it.